Good morning and a very warm welcome to Holy Trinity Church and a very warm welcome to those of you joining us online today. It's very good to be with you all, very good as we begin this second week of Advent, that great season of preparation. How good it is to take some time to step aside from the business of the outside world and to allow our inner lives to be nourished by God in this place. Please would you turn to page two of your service book and please would you stand. Elizabeth has lit for us the second of our Advent candles. And so I'm going to say the prayer to begin our service. Blessed are you, Sovereign Lord, just and true. To you be praise and glory forever. Of old you spoke by the mouth of your prophets, but in our days you speak through your Son, whom you have appointed the heir of all things. Grant us, your people, to walk in this light, that we may be found ready and watching when he comes again in glory and judgment. For you are our light and our salvation. Blessed be God forever. Hymn number 27. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Please sit for our opening prayers.
And so as we gather in God's presence, so we open our hearts and minds to receive the word of God, to be stirred by God in our preparation to meet his coming son. When the Lord comes, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Therefore, in the light of Christ, let us confess our sins. God our Father, long-suffering, full of grace and truth, you create us from nothing and give us life. You give your faithful people new life in the water of baptism. You do not turn your face from us, nor cast us aside. We confess that we have sinned against you and our neighbor. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. Restore us for the sake of your Son and bring us to heavenly joy in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw you to himself and cleanse you from all your sins, that you may behold the glory of God's Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, raise up, we pray, your power and come among us, and with great might succor us, that whereas through our sins and wickedness we are grievously hindered in running the race that is set before us, your bountiful grace and mercy may speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory now and forever. Amen. We hear our first Bible reading. A reading from the book of the prophet Malachi. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. This is the word of the Lord.
Alleluia, alleluia. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Alleluia. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iturea and Traconitus and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. She must have known what the repercussions of her actions would be. She must have known as she sat there that she would be arrested. Indeed, the bus driver made it very clear that he was going to call the police. She must have known as she staunchly refused to budge that she might lose her job, that she may receive death threats, that she could be admonished by as many as, or more than, those who revered her. She must have known all that, but she did it anyway. I speak, as you will probably have worked out, of Rosa Parks, an extraordinary woman of colour in Alabama who, on this very weekend, 66 years ago, refused to give up her seat for a white passenger. She has always been a particular hero of mine, but she is not the only extraordinary person associated with the 5th of December. Today is also the day when the first civil partnership took place here in the UK, in fact, just a few miles away in Worthing, between Matthew Roche and Christopher Cramp. Roche, who was terminally ill, died the next day. The 5th of December is also the birthday of some extraordinary people, of Charity Earl Adams, the highest-ranking African-American woman to serve in World War II, of Sajid Javid, the first person of colour to hold one of this country's great offices of state, of Christina Rossetti, who used her remarkable gifts with words to speak out against slavery, sexism, exploitation and animal cruelty. I sometimes think of these people and so many like them as voices crying out in the wilderness like Rosa Parks, as she kept her seat on that segregated bus in Montgomery, they must have known the challenges that they would face on the path to which they felt called. They must have known that there would be many 
so many, too many, who would dislike them because of what they were rather than who they were, who would do anything in their power to stifle the message they tried to proclaim. Despite that, and exhausting though it must sometimes have been, they kept crying out. Our world and our lives are the better for it. The words of Luke chapter 6 and those it recalls from Isaiah chapter 40 must be some of the best-known Advent verses. The six we heard today have at their heart the phrase, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. And it's easy, I think, to skip over those words, concentrating instead on the glorious redemption which the promised Lord will apparently bring, the straightening of the crooked, the smoothing of the rough. But I think that phrase actually goes to the heart of the passage's message, as well as its structure. Partly I'm convinced of that because of the long list of grand-sounding names which precedes it. From a historical point of view, the writer of Luke's Gospel could simply have given us the first ten words in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius. That would have provided more than enough information for future readers to know exactly when this story is set. Why then does he go on to list all the governors of all the surrounding areas and to note that two of these important people were in fact brothers? I can only think that he does this to emphasize in some way the precise nature of the wilderness into which John's lone voice was crying. This is not, I think, purely about a physical wilderness so much as a political and societal one, John, the writer seems to suggest, is not like all the big fancy people just named. The wilderness into which he is called to cry is one of strict hierarchy, of doors closed to more than to whom they are open, of rulers and subjects, of inequality. If that's reading too much into a simple list of names, and it may well be, then perhaps the final verse of this passage gives us another clue. The voice in the wilderness ends by saying that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. All flesh. Not then the great and glorious few who know each other and lord it over the rest of us, but all flesh. That, perhaps, is what the mountains and hills being made low means as well, that the coming of the promised saviour is about an ironing out of injustice, about a challenging of the status quo, about a smashing of the system. To John, as to Rosa Parks, and so many other voices crying out in the wilderness, that must have felt a desolate, desperate vocation. But they did it anyway. What then are the implications for us as people of faith today, and particularly in this season of waiting and hoping as we thousands of years later prepare the way of the Lord during Advent? For me, there are two areas for reflection here. The first is an acceptance of our countercultural nature. I am deeply wary of saying that because it could sound like an excuse, couldn't it, for dwindling numbers of attendees in churches around the world or like a don't care attitude when, as often happens, faith is ignored or mocked or abused by others. That is not at all my intention. Instead, I think these words offer a challenge to us to understand the nature of the wilderness of which we are one part, to understand the world in which we live, to play our role in it, to be of it. It annoys me, if I'm honest, when the church makes too much of its otherworldly status and nature. Whatever our beliefs, we are called, surely, to be part of the world, to be incarnational as our Lord was, to stand squarely with everybody around us, whether proclaimed Christian or not. Rosa Parks did not cry into the wilderness for her own sake, or for her town, or even for her black brothers and sisters. 
She cried into the wilderness for humanity. John, I think, was doing the same. Secondly, though, I think today's Gospel reading calls us to be braver. To be a lone voice is not an easy thing. We know from history, from Parks and Javid and Roche and Adams and Rossetti and so many others, that it is a path of extraordinary courage and which can lead to extraordinary bullying, harassment and victimisation. I do not believe, though, that our Christian calling encourages us or perhaps even permits us to accept things where we know them in our hearts and in our prayers and in our fellowship to be wrong. Here, our example is not only the extraordinary heroes of history, but God made man, the utterly divine human who came to live among us and teach us his ways. However much scripture we want to debate and disagree about, and I'm sure that is a good thing to do, Jesus Christ, I think we probably agree, did not leave the framework of unfairness which he found on earth to continue unchecked. He ironed out injustice. He challenged the status quo. He smashed the system. If we are called to try and follow his example, that means taking the difficult choices he took too. Would I, seated on that bus, have behaved as Rosa Parks did? Would I have had the courage to cry out in the wilderness? Each of us is called just to be who we are, to do the best we can, to believe that God will love us regardless. But in this season of preparation and prayer, perhaps each of us can consider where we are called to cry out how we are meant to play our role in helping all flesh to see the salvation of God and to commit ourselves anew to following in the extraordinary example of those prophets and heroes who have walked this God-given earth before us. Amen. We stand to declare our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Do not worry about anything, but in prayer with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Let us pray. Patient God, who has been with us through the ages, Help us to make sense of your gifts of guidance and wisdom spoken through the words of the prophets, that we may use them in our daily lives so to come ever closer to you. As we prepare for the coming of the baby Jesus into our lives and retell the familiar stories of long journeys travelled by people with faith and hope, with you, Lord, as the ultimate destination. Strengthen us for the journey ahead, that we may be prepared for the day when we also will stand before you, 
offering ourselves for your judgment. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. God of all the seasons, help us to see that there is a time for all things, rest and renewal, preparation and plans for the future, hard work and the satisfaction of a job well done. Give us the wisdom to live our lives in the way you want for us, working with the rhythm of life rather than fighting against it. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. God of love and light, we pray that your church here on earth <clears throat> shall serve you well, reflecting the love and light that come only from you, <clears throat> and spreading your word among the people, that they may be saved from the dominion of darkness. We pray for Robert, Tom, Jonathan, Rod, Brian, Ben, and Corin as they sacrifice themselves to your service. We pray for all those who dedicate their lives to the service of others and ask that we may be given the chance to do as they do. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord <laughs> graciously hear us. God of compassion and justice, help those in peril around the world. Bring justice upon all your lands. Make evildoers see the errors of their ways. And give your spirit to those who work to end oppression in all its guises. We pray for those who are suffering and those who care for them. We give thanks for the lives of those who have died and come before you in the faith of Jesus Christ. Lord, hear us. Lord, Lord graciously hear us. In a moment of silence, we offer you our own personal prayers. We say together, Almighty, Almighty God, God, give us, us grace, grace to cast, to cast away, away the works of darkness and to put on the armour of light, now in the time of this mortal life in which, in which your Son, Jesus Christ, came to, came to us in great humility, that on, on the last day, when, when he shall come again in his glorious majesty to judge the living and the dead, we may, we may rise to the life immortal, through him who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please would you stand. In the tender mercy of our God, the day spring from on high shall break upon us to give light to those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. We exchange a sign of peace with one another.
as the grain once scattered in the fields and the grapes once dispersed on the hillside are now reunited on this table in bread and wine. So, Lord, may your whole church soon be gathered together from the corners of the earth into your kingdom. Amen. The Lord be with you. So with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. You are worthy of our thanks and praise, Lord God of truth, for by the breath of your mouth you have spoken your word and all things have come into being. You fashioned us in your image and placed us in the garden of your delight. Though we chose the path of rebellion, you would not abandon your own. Again and again, you drew us into your covenant of grace. You gave your people the law and taught us by your prophets to look for your reign of justice, mercy, and peace. As we watch for the signs of your kingdom on earth, we echo the song of the angels in heaven, evermore praising you and singing... Lord God, you are the most holy one, enthroned in splendor and light. Yet in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, you reveal the power of your love made perfect in our human weakness. Embracing our humanity, Jesus showed us the way of salvation. Loving us to the end, he gave himself to death for us. Dying for his own, he set us free from the bonds of sin, that we might rise and reign with him in glory. On the night, he gave up himself for us all. He took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. Lord, we believe. Therefore, we proclaim the death that he suffered on the cross. We celebrate his resurrection, his bursting from the tomb. We rejoice that he reigns at your right hand on high, and we long for his coming in glory. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. As we recall the one perfect sacrifice for our redemption, Father, by your Holy Spirit, let these gifts of your creation be to us the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Form us into the likeness of Christ and make us a perfect offering in your sight. Look with favour on your people and in your mercy hear the cry of our hearts. Bless the earth, heal the sick, let the oppressed go free, and fill your church with power from on high. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Gather your people from the ends of the earth to feast with all your saints at the table in your kingdom where the new creation is brought to perfection in Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory be yours, Almighty Father, for ever and ever. 
Amen. As we look for the coming of the kingdom, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Most merciful Lord, your love compels us to come in. Our hands were unclean. Our hearts were unprepared. We were not fit even to eat the crumbs from under your table. But you, Lord, are the God of our salvation and share your bread with sinners. So cleanse and feed us with the precious body and blood of your Son, that he may live in us and we in him, and that we with the whole company of Christ may sit and eat in your kingdom. Amen.
Friends, the chief uh, message for today is to say at to, still near the beginning of this Advent season, thank you very much for your support, which is coming in many ways. We're particularly keen that during this Advent and Christmas season, we can keep parish activities and worship going in as full a way as possible and in a reliable way. Last year, I seem to remember having to either cancel or then reinstate things at the last moment as regulations changed. Uh, but your support to keep things going as much as we can at the moment is, is really appreciated. And that happens in a number of ways, uh, wearing masks being one of them, uh, obviously, for this week. Preparations for the services, whether it's um, uh, the choir practices or the, the decorations coming up. I'm also aware that in this coming week, it really begins the week of school carol services and other uh, concerts from many in Guildford who want to come to this church uh, to, as a place to celebrate. And so it means whether it's the stewards or the cleaners uh, making space for them. And I suppose the final thing I'll mention at this time, um, especially with many people coming through the doors of our churches, um, our finances need your support. Uh, we do what we can so that occasional visitors uh, can give to us. And the more regular visitors, whether it's the red button on the website or being part of planned giving, our finances really do need your support. As I hope as we edge towards 2022, when things will be uh, more straightforward and reliable. And perhaps I mention that at the moment, because we've given, um, we give 10% of our income away each year to local and national charities. And the second tranche of that went just a few weeks ago. And therefore, in the last 10 days, I've had quite a number of letters of, um, moving letters of gratitude from local charities, whether it's Samaritans or uh, charities working with people with mental health difficulties or whatever, really grateful both for our financial donations and also remembering them in our prayers. So I suppose the overall message is let us keep going and the support that we can give one another, whether online or here in church, is really appreciated. And perhaps to that end, I can just say a couple of people have now mentioned to me that the regulations to do with yellow lines and parking around Guildford have recently changed. I see a number of you nodding. I'd much rather you give the money to the, to the church than get a parking fine. Let's just put it like that. So wherever you park, you may have parked there for the last 20 years, but don't assume you can park there now. I don't know, I walk to church, I'm lucky, but yellow lines have changed recently, take care. So finally I'll say worship tonight, choral evensong as usual at six o'clock, and I'm delighted to say that the recordings from last week's worship, both of the Advent carol service, which was majestic, but also uh, the recording of last Sunday morning, which went awry and apparently the recording of my sermon stopped halfway. <laughs> now, if you want to hear the second half of the sermon, it's also online. Jonathan. Thank you, Robert. Please would you turn in your service book to page 28. The prayer after communion, and please would you stand. O oh Lord our God, make us watchful and keep us faithful as we await the coming of your Son, our Lord, that when he shall appear, he may not find us sleeping in sin, but active in his service and joyful in his praise. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And on the bottom of page 29, we say together the prayer for the second Sunday in Advent. God, our Father, you spoke to the prophets of old of a saviour who would bring peace. You helped them to spread the joyful message of his coming kingdom. Help us as we prepare to celebrate his birth, to share with those around us the good news of your power and love. We ask this through Jesus Christ, the light who is coming into the world. Amen.
Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you, scatter the darkness from before your path, and make you ready to meet him when he comes in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you and those whom you love and pray for today and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.